Hi folks, how are we all doing? It's Colin here at Robson Rover Repair. Yet again, you find me in the shed of doom. Um, tonight's job is going to be producing a basic service guide for anyone who has a Freelander 2, specifically targeting the diesel engines covering both the TD4 and the SD4. Essentially the same engines, but with different power outputs. Now we're going to be focusing on the manual tonight, not the automatic, because the vehicle in question is a manual. Therefore, we'll not be tackling the uh, automatic fluids or anything like that. And as the vehicle quite recently had its haldex and all changed and all those sorts of fluids associated with the drivetrain, we won't have to do that. This is purely focusing on the basic filters and oils. So what are we going to be doing? Well, we're going to do a basic oil change on the engine. We're going to do the basic oil filter on the engine, showing you the best way of doing it with the best tool that will make your life a lot easier when trying to tackle it. It's a notoriously awkward job. Um, we're going to be doing the engine bay diesel fuel filter as well. Very much always worth doing on any of these vehicles considering the quality of diesel can vary greatly in and around the United Kingdom and Ireland. We'll be doing the air intake filter as well which is piss easy to do. Anyone can do that themselves. Um, you should never be paying anyone to do that one. And we'll be doing a cabin filter as well. Another really easy one as well. And then when it's all done, I'm going to give the vehicle a wee clean and a um, air con cleansing as well. Um, that's just something that's completely optional. Today we're going to be using a mixture of Bosch parts and Napa oils. I will be giving links to all parts in the description and throughout the video you'll see them up in the top corner available for you to purchase directly on eBay. There are other parts available as always however I recommend Bosch for Land Rover products. Choose your own, make yourself happy. That's what I've used consistently on my father's vehicles for the last several years and whenever I had several Land Rovers it's what I primarily used as well when allowed. So Let's get into this. Um, I'm going to do just a quick show of what parts we're going to be using. And um, as we go along, any tips, advice, torque settings, etc., will not only be in the video, but will also be in the description below underneath the individual parts as required. So let's get into it and let's see uh, just how easy it is. This will probably be a longer video by the time everything's recorded, so please bear with me. And if you're not a Land Rover fan, why don't you stick around? Who knows? You might actually learn something because a lot of this stuff that fits the Freelander 2 transfers very, very well over to the Evoque. And they share the same diesel engine platform as well. So I'm sure there's plenty of you folks out there whose other halves have an Evoque. This could potentially save you a few quid too. Let's get ripped into it. And hopefully this is a hassle-free, and I probably just jinx myself saying that, a hassle-free service. Okay, to start off we're going to be doing the oil change on the vehicle. First thing you're going to need whenever you're doing an oil change on one of these Freelander 2.2s is 5.9 litres of oil. Um, I've chosen 5W30. It's up to yourself what you choose. I usually do oil changes every 8,000 miles, so I'm very more than happy to be using this. Um, fully synthetic, personally recommended. I wouldn't be putting too much else into them, especially for the duration cycle on them. Land Rover recommends 15,000 miles. I personally half it and add 10%. That keeps me happy. Next job will actually be the physical oil filter itself. Uh, mounted on a plastic housing at the front of the engine, in between the engine and the radiator. Uh, absolute pain on the backside to get at, but this is your best friend for doing it. You're going to need a 27mm flexi ratchet spanner. Because you're going to put that on and then you're going to click, 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 get it off, get the housing off, get it cleaned. Swap the uh, O-ring and the filter over, put it back on and tighten it up. Not a hard job to do, but if you're using the wrong tool on that plastic housing, you can crack it, you can smash it and get yourselves into all sorts of problems. Very, very worthwhile having one of these in your toolbox, just in case. And I will leave a link to this below. It was pretty cheap on Amazon the last time I checked. So I'm going to put it up right up here now for you to buy one if you're interested. Next thing, another easy wee job in these as well, is the engine air filter. Um, Bosch part number there as well, clearly see. Nice and simple, hassle-free, top of the engine, really, really easy to get at. Cabin filter in one of these, also stupidly easy to get at as well. Yet again, Bosch. 
and you'll be able to see just how simple a job that is to do when we're in there and the fuel filter as well and if you've ever watched any of my rover 75 videos again you can't go wrong it's directional it's only mounted in with a couple of screws pish pash posh put it in and unlike other ones this is a complete housing replacement with the filter built in you don't need to separate it you unplug you replace you prime and off you go that simple and yet again bosh as well we aircon cleaner will be going in and the vehicle will be getting the clean because i'm sure my father probably has it a wee bit dirty from all the work he does so yes that is it um now let's get around to the vehicle itself and get tore into it all now i don't know about anyone else but i have the personal rule of thumb when i'm working on anyone else's car i always start inside then work my way out the reason i do that is so that you don't get dirty so first things first we're going to do the cabin filter on this land rover very easy to do very simple to do and i'm going to show you exactly how to access it now so gaining entry into the passenger footwell bring the camera up you can see here and i will highlight it this is the area that the housing for the cabin filter sits in very easy to get at it just clips up up there you just about see that as i turn that sideways and it slides out we'll get this done here it only takes a few seconds to do a little bit tricky to show whilst holding the camera here but what you're essentially doing is taking this piece of panel taking the three prongs individually bending them that way so away and the panel then comes around like that and comes off fitting is reverse it's just hooking it in and pop it'll go in filter itself can be a wee bit tricky to pull out depending how long it's been in there as you can see this one is not in amazing condition and yes the wires do get in the way but just be patient and it'll come out whoa she's a she's a spicy one that oh look at the mold oh look at the mold the moldy moldy mold yeah i'd say that's well well past uh its service date by comparison hmm hmm uh, I would say, believe it or not, I changed that um, about three years ago and it hasn't needed one since because of the mileage but it just shows you how crazy it is. What brand was that? Man, well, it's held up well. Held up well. Right, uh, and as you can see, fitting is just a reverse of that. It is a little bit tricky putting it in so I'm going to put the camera down and I'll show you it when it's done. Right then. That is the cabin filter back in place. And I want to show you what trips a lot of people up. This wire and this wire here, whenever you're fitting it, you need to tuck it out of the way. Often people will struggle trying to refit this because of that. It really is that simple a case of just push that wire out of the way and push that wire to the side. There's plenty of flex in it. My advice is to thumb at it from that angle and twist it in. When you get the top and bottom in, it will just glide in. It's really easy, really simple. Just be careful, obviously, not to rip the filter. But again, three out of 10 and can be done in less than five minutes. Now to refit this, nice and simple again. Get the camera back at the right angle. Put that up into the right place. And you can just see the wee clips there that it's supposed to go on to. So I can get that there. So you're getting them in behind this panel and then sliding into place. And as we can see, that's it refitted back in place. If you do not have these various little seals all clipped on properly, you will get a horrendous whistling noise. I do not recommend it to anyone, but it's a really good giveaway. Like I say, there's one, two, three prongs at the side, and there's one, two, three little identical overlays that go on, like so. And the lead is blocking the other one. There, you can just see it in the middle there. Really, really easy to do. Um, I would say it's slightly awkward if you have a bit of a bad back, 
but it's far from the most difficult thing. I would say if there was anything you were going to do on one of these, do this first. It would probably be the easiest job to do. First job to do now is to pop the bonnet. Whenever you're popping the bonnet on a Freelander 2, it's always in the passenger foot well. And whenever you're lifting the bonnet up, and always remember it's behind the R where the wee latch is to lift up. Now we've got plenty of engine covers and other bits and pieces to tackle here before we're going to get into anything. Trying to give you a general visualisation of what you should be looking for, any unusual leaks, problems, bad pipes and so on and so forth. Pretty simple enough engine when we get in, trying to give you a bit of an angle so you can see where the uh, oil filter housing is. It's in there somewhere and you'll see it later on in the video. But for now, it's just a general inspection before I get in the anthem. No point creating more work if I discover there's a more serious problem to be worried about. Checking the likes of the alternator belts, etc. in case there's any obvious visual problems, but you'll see that whenever you have the under tray off as well. Here, as I'm sitting pointing this camera in on the lens and the light, you can just about and no more make out the filter housing that I'm talking about removing. I will point a wee quick arrow on it here as well. This is where you'll have a bit of fun in a little while's time, but at the minute now, the plan is to start tackling the vehicle's air and fuel filter. At the time of recording this, I had the engine ticken over so that the oil would be ready to drip out, which is why I've muted the sound so that everyone's not deaf from the glorious sounds of the 2.2 diesel engine. I thought I would spare you that torture, as whilst it is a very refined engine, I must admit, I think it's a little bit loud for what it is, but then it would betray its origins based on being the uh, transit van engine. So no doubt it was for a more agricultural purpose before being retrofitted into the Freelander 2. Finally, we've done all those bits and pieces then. We've checked everything else over. This is the air filter housing held in by a couple of torque screws. Always have to remember whenever we're doing this to actually unplug the MAF. You can do that just by unplugging that as we go. But other than that, a simple enough job. But in here behind this piece of metal is the fuel filter housing. And we will have to take off the engine cover. Three bolts holds it in place. And one of the bolts also holds the air intake system in place too. Depending how you want to do it, it's actually quite a simple process. Okay, so the next job then, we are going to be fitting our engine air filter. Handy enough job. Truthfully, it's probably the handiest job, even compared to the cabin filter. But what are we going to do? So first thing we need is our T30 Torx. I couldn't remember if it was T25 or T30, but it was T30 on the day. And at each corner of the airbox, as located here, there are four little Torx based screws. Now, you don't have to fully remove them. I personally do because I was checking them to make sure that there hadn't been any damage or any problems with the housing and the plastics, etc. Now, the next thing you want to do is remove the battery cover, just like this. It just pops off two clips at the back, and that will give you access to the two rear torque screws. Again, super quick. And again, once we see this, well, the four screws have been removed, you're just going to be able to lift up the air housing. Now, what I always personally recommend with the four screws removed, just to give yourself that little bit of room in case you don't want to damage and stretching the wire, is just to unplug the MAF. The MAF air pro center just sitting at the top. That's what I'm doing. We little red clip, just push it in. This one was particularly stiff. Slide it to the side, pull your air filter out, compare it against the new one. Say to yourself, well, that's definitely not in the best condition. And then I always clean out any excess leaves and twigs and bits of fluff and dust, etc. Now, if this was all you were doing, you'd just be putting your air filter back in and tightening it back up. But because we will be doing our fuel filter, which is the next stage of the process, I'm going to show you what we're going to do now. The fuel filter removal is a wee bit more involved, to be completely honest. At the back, there is a 10 mil bolt holding the air intake pipe in place. And with the front then, you have two 8mm bolts holding the engine cover in place. All you're going to do now is essentially lift up the air intake pipe. And once you've done that, you can remove the engine cover as a whole piece. Please take note at the rear right of the engine cover, how it sits in. There's a wee sort of screw guide where the air intake pipe fits into. You're going to see me lift that there out of the way. And then the engine cover itself pops into place. There's two little sort of like we pop plastics things and push it to the side. 
Now, this is whenever you're looking at the engine directly below what the fuel filter housing is protected by. Normally, there are four bolts in place, 10 mils, which will be the job for removing. Very, very simple and handy done. And got to take off the protective plate. Once you have the protective plate removed, you will get full access to the fuel filter. Now, this is the beginning process of me removing the protective plate. And you'll see as we're going on here, as I remove the various bolts, this vehicle only had three of the four bolts in place. However, I would recommend where possible to make sure you have the four. I didn't have a replacement handy that would fit correctly. So I have just refitted as was found. You'll find you have absolutely no problems whatsoever. Plenty of space in there. However, I would be very cautious simply from the point of view of when you're actually removing the 10 mil nuts at the end, not to drop them or else you'll end up looking for them. But more than anything else, there's the chance you could actually drop the ones on the left hand side down into the alternator. My advice would be to loosen them about 90% off and then screw them off with your finger. I actually thought to myself I wasn't even too happy eventually using my glove. So I took my glove off and wanted to make sure I used my bare fingers on it as well. Plenty of room, no pipes in the way, no major issues, no hard aircon pipes or anything like that. Everything's very soft and malleable in this part of the engine. And it gives you great access and gives you virtually no problems at all. Um, one thing I will say is whenever you're removing it again, just to make sure you actually spend the time looking exactly where you're removing this plate, it slides straight forward. And once it slides straight forward, you are just pulling it forward and diagonally to the left. It's slightly awkward from the point of view of the first time you remove it. But once you see it come off, you'll laugh at how simplistic it is. Um, room fitting is exactly the reverse of process as described here. It's a quite a simple thing to do. And once you actually have it off, like I say, in your hands, you will chuckle at it. It seems to be more of a heat shielding protective barrier than anything else, as well as preventing any unnecessary movement of the fuel filter housing especially considering the likelihood of extremely high fuel pressure used in modern common rail diesel engines. So we have it off. And as you can see, you have a great view here of the actual fuel filter. You will be unclipping the various clips here. Please make a mental note of what clips go where. I would highly recommend, if you have never done this before, to take a photograph of the actual fuel filter clip locations and piping locations before you remove them all. It is a very, very simple process. And I would also recommend you will see me here in a minute removing one of the wiring clips uh, to the sensor. The reason I simply do that is the possibility of any wires being stretched or nipped, etc. You can see even how I'm moving it. The wire is basically at its full length of capacity. This then gives you loads and loads of room to take to the final stage, which is removing the three securing uh, hex nuts that hold the housing into place. This was a T7, and for handy reference, it's the same size of a um, six-sided hex tool as you would actually use on your brakes on these vehicles as well, which is a size 7, if memory comes off the top of my head. So then um, it's simply a case of unscrew it all. Now, you will hear me talking about this in a minute, the importance of pre-priming uh, your fuel filter. But as I have removed all this, you'll see then me lifting it off and there's a little pipe underneath, which is part of the drainage system. you are got to be careful when you're pulling that off that it's hard to even see from this angle but you'll see me reaching in for it and checking it. It's a little clear pipe and um, part of the breathing system on these. And all you want to do is whenever you're refitting it is to refit it in the reverse. Now, when you are refitting this, this is again where I'm going to talk about this in depth in a minute. I have mine pre-primed with fuel and I have my finger over the bottom of it. So that it means that the little pipe, as described earlier, will not be leaking out everywhere. 
you see me reaching in for this little pipe where it actually sits into the housing, fits into the bottom, slide it into place, and voila. At this point then, I'm just putting the actual housing reverse back in. And you can see we're doing this nice and quick, as quick as possible, because we're trying not to introduce any unnecessary air into the system. And this then will be described in more detail, the importance of priming the system later on. Again, it's a reverse of the process. We're just tightening everything up. We're just putting all bolts and torques and everything back in. These do not need to be crazy tight or you will crack the housing. You're talking a nice, snug, tight fit. Common sense needs to be applied for these three hex bolts. If you crack the housing at this stage, your only choice really is to reuse your old one and then you're going to have to reprime it as well. It can happen if it's a cheaper product. Again, that's why I would highly recommend using Bosch or similar other Land Rover OEM product that is of equal or if not better quality. Just nice and snib tight as you can see here as I've been describing. And once we have the three of them done up, we'll be reattaching the various pipes and sensor plugs. Now this is the point that we're getting to just tighten everything up here. Um, thankfully the Freelander 2 diesel fuel filter can only be fitted one way. You fitting it wrong, the housing will not go on correctly. If you fit it wrong, it's never going to look right, it's never going to flow right. On top of that as well, we have the directional arrows on the system showing the direction of the fuel. So truthfully, the only thing you could possibly get wrong is getting the reattaching of the pipes incorrect. But there's not that much flexible movement in the pipes that you'd really be able to do that. Now, speaking of, um, again, and you're going to hear me talking about this in great length soon, the importance of this fuel filter being primed. You will not be able to crank this system and bleed this system unless you actually have primed this filter. It just will not do it. You will end up damaging the vehicle, you end up damaging the pipes, you end up damaging the injectors, all sorts like that. It will crank and crank and crank until the day the, the world ends, but it will not start. And do not even think about spraying some easy start in the, to get it going. That will not pull the fuel up. You really do need to either have the fuel filter fully pre-pined with diesel or using one of the pumping mechanisms that we're going to talk about here in a minute. There's another company on YouTube have done this exact opposite method, haven't given some real bad advice doing this, and because of that, you actually see it all going wrong. So at this stage here, you see me refitting the engine cover and the eight mils to the front and the 10s to the rear. This is where you would be, and this is where I was, because I knew I had my engine fuel filter completely primed and there was no concerns. But with the rain coming down pretty harsh, I thought to myself, just get this all wrapped up nice and quick. Again, these are not especially needing to be done to torque spec or anything like that. They're just tight as tight for an engine cover. And as long as you have your two wee pop-in dials in place, it's going to go nowhere. Just remember to be cautious about doing the one at the rear, which is the 10 mil, as it's part of the air intake system and you want it correctly aligned so it doesn't slap about or cause problems under the bonnet. Okay, so here's the thing. It started emptying down there and I threw the engine cover on. But what I never showed you, and I've taken the engine cover off again, is the TD4 and the SD4 2.2 engines all need their fuel filter to either be pre-filled or you can use a bleeding device. Now, I had pre-filled mine with diesel already. I'm going to show you it now. This little nozzle here is where it would go into. And I'm going to show you this now. It's a very, very easy thing to do. You will see in other guides about using priming bulbs and stuff like that. There's absolutely no need for it in the slightest. And here's one we've made earlier. So forgive this. I actually dug this out of the bin. It's got a bit of cat litter on it. This is the plunger. In fact, this is actually a water depth measuring. So you can see for contamination and things like that. Just goes in there. 
uses a six set of Torx, uh, goes in, screws in, etc. The way I do it personally is a little filter over the top and fill it so it's brimming right to the top so that whenever you are pushing that little plunger in and tightening it up, you get a little drip. That will completely fill that. Now, you really don't need to go higher than the rim. So, or otherwise, you're gonna get spillage there, there, especially when you're tilting it in and putting it into the system. But that is the easiest way to do it. High pressure, com real diesel engine systems can be a bit of a pig. If you don't do them right, they can be very tricky to bleed. The, this engine in particular is, it's not that it's tricky to bleed, it's just if you've never done one before, I guarantee you, you'll make this mistake. You can buy the priming bulb kits, etc. on Amazon. There's absolutely no need for it. And whenever you tighten this up again, you can see it just screws in nice and handy. And then it'll get to a certain stage and you're just screwing, you're just screwing, you're just screwing. And that's it. Now, when you're putting it back in, make sure this O-ring is in there and you're putting it straight in. Easiest way to do it, it saves a lot of hassle, it saves a lot of pressure. And before you start the car, prime it four or five times anyway, just by turning it on. Don't use your clutch, you'll hear your fuel pump going and switching it off, switch it on again, you hear your fuel pump going. If you have this primed in full, the car will start, take three or four seconds to crank and that's it. And that is the secret and the easiest way possible of doing a TD4 Freelander Mark II or an SD4 Freelander Mark II fuel filter without giving yourself any problems. Okay, so we have done our cabin filter, we have done our oil filter, very close together, and we've done our fuel filter. Now we're going to do our oil and our oil filter. And there's a very, very good reason why I do things in this order on the Freelander 2. And it's actually to do with the nut on the engine cover. And we're going to show you this right now. Now, this nut is right above the oil cap filler. If you were taking that off and had that loose or were changing that oil, or heaven forbid, you had forgotten to tighten it up, maybe like so, whenever you're just letting the oil breathe, there's always a chance always a chance that that could end up in there so sounds silly but it's one of the best ways of preventing an accident and believe me i've read about it on the forums it's not something you want to get involved in doing these engines are an absolute stripping session and if you get that in there well you might as well set the thing in fire oh jesus i'm definitely not 21 anymore Oh, Jesus. Okay, so there's only a couple of bolts hold this in place. Three each side, if memory serves, they are 15. I get them off and then we will get to the oil cap. Now, some people will remove this bit of plastic here. With this ratchet spanner, you can actually not have to do that as long as you're willing to do that. And yes, you'll see I'm doing this without jacking the car up. This is possible to do this without jacking the car up. I am fortunate I have a bit of a slant on the driveway that I can park this on. But if you do feel the need to jack this up, make sure you're jacking your Freelander up well. They're a heavy, heavy car. So I'm going to get this off and then I'll show you what we're looking at underneath here next. Now, with the under tray off, I always take the chance to give it a degrease. For a couple of reasons. I like to make sure next time I'm going under there, if there's any weird, strange patterns, obvious signs, leaks of oil or anything like that, different types of oil that I can just turn around and say, looking at it quickly, that's the type of oil it is, that's an approximate location. But as you can see, folks, dead easy to take off. One, two, three, four, five, six holes. Um, bolts are not going crazy taut either. So now we're going to get underneath this here. I'm going to show you where the plug is and get it all drained out. Leave that there actually for a wee minute. Might need to do a bit more. So... Hold on, we're going vertical. With the under tray removed, we can clearly see exactly where the oil plug is for draining the oil out of the system. And whilst we're under here, 
I just take the opportunity to look for any unusual leaks, sign of diesel, fuel, coolant leaks, etc. Um, thankfully, this car is a pretty clean example and shows that it's been well maintained and cared for by my father as well. So I'm pretty happy. Onwards and upwards and get it off. Okay, so my memory wasn't what it was. It's actually a 21 socket for the sump plug. And it's just draining away now as we speak. Oil's not in bad condition considering it's only about, probably about 9,000 miles old at this moment in time. But yes, now the next job is obviously to get that ridiculously placed oil filter off. Gonna let that drain for about another five minutes or so, get everything out. Leave our new copper washer on, get that reattached, and I'll show the torque specifications for it all as well when we're all done. Now this is where the fun really starts. Um, you can see the oil down at the bottom there. I am gonna have to reach up from underneath, get my 27 millimeter flexible ratchet onto this and get the oil housing off. It's a slow, slow process. It's a pain in the backside to do, but it's gotta be done. And it's the only way to do it without giving yourself major, major ball ache. So let's get this done and get that oil out of the way. Okay, folks, this is the gap that I work with. You can clearly see the bonnet open up here. Um, this gives you plenty of room to get the housing off without having to dismantle it. The only thing you have to do is this pipe here on our left hand side, you push it slightly to the side when removing the housing. It's a flexible pipe, there's no issues at all. You move it about a fifth of a turn at a time. It is a bit of a slow process, but it's not that hard. And then I personally recommend, once you have it loose, just putting your right hand up there, unscrewing it, and then whenever you're refitting, doing the same. About to do the same and throw it on, and it'll only take me a few minutes to do. So after a little bit of slightly awkward spanner spinning that involves using that ratchet in kind of like a like a J direction, um, you only really move it about a fifth of a turn at a time, but it means you don't have to dismantle the front half of the bumper. We have the oil filter housing off. Now it has been replaced with new O-ring and Bosch oil filter. Now, some of these oil filters don't have the anti-crush proofing in it, Genuine Bosch and other similar ones do. Highly recommend it or else you end up with a compressed oil filter and then you get oil light errors on the dashboard. Common problem, same sort of situation as you get in the Mini R50. Uh, I've never seen one of these that didn't have the cage on the inside of it, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. So buyer beware when you're buying brands. Check with the links in the description for what to buy, everything in this video. I'll throw this back on and then we're gonna to top up the oil and see how she sounds afterwards. Right, as you can see, this is exactly what I'm talking about, how I do this. Nice and simple, you just get the ratchet on with the bandy and it's just clickety click, click, click. It's a slow process. Oh Jesus, it's terrible. There we are. But it works brilliantly and it saves you a whole pile of hassle. Now all we're going to do is top up the oil, 5.9 litres. Personally, what I usually do is I put in the 5 litres and then I put in maybe a little bit more from the 1 litre and leave it sitting overnight and top it up again. I don't like to drive it until I make sure the oil levels are absolutely perfect. Obviously, you don't want to underfill or overfill, but it's better to be careful rather than having to drain the whole system in and start again. Because at the end of the day, oil costs money. So that's us, and thankfully that's all this servicing done. And that's that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, not an overly hard job. I made it more dirty for myself, drifty cold, by cleaning the under tray. Not something I need to do, it's something I like to do regardless. You will not get this job done using this method. Right, your flexi 20 mil spanner link is in the description it will save you dismantling the whole front cover of that front bumper it is a major pain in the ass dismantling that whereas you're going you literally put it on like that the ratchet's on and you're so easy you can get your arm up to it it's going to sound really bad 
can't get your arm up to it once you have it loose and spin it off and when you're taking it out you just pull it straight down straight back up um, if you've ever given birth assisted a cow giving birth you'll know the exact movement I'm talking about <laughs> yeah that's it um, have a wee celebrate we drink now Dragon Energy link in the description as always that's it I'm going to let it pick over now for about another 5 minutes I'm going to let it cool for 2 hours and then I'll check the oil That's simple folks They're a really really easy car to service and maintain A really easy car to look after This has never given any issues with the EGR It did give an issue with the EPF Easy fix And um, when we got it there was an issue with the Haldex Again easy fix to just replace the whole lot Great motors, I love them. I'll probably buy one if I'm honest in the not too distant future. Um, whenever my 75 Pure comes with videos, I'll probably go diesel automatic to be honest as I like the automatic. But yeah, that's it. That easy. Get out and get the spanner spin and uh, get your Land Rover Freelander 2 done. I would say you could probably do this comfortably in an hour. Um, it's your first time you're ever going to give yourself two hours. Not a lot of work in it. Um, I've listed all the torch packages in the description. I have all the bolt sizes that come along the bottom, etc. You can't go wrong. This is not one of these jobs where people will tell you, oh, you do it this way, and there's a trick to know. The only trick is this 27mm Flexi Ratchet Spanner. If you have one of these, the link is in the description below. You can do all your whole car for service and everything. Real easy. Really like these a lot. Um, you can actually really see the Ford influences over the Lambo influences. But hey, uh, interesting car. A lot of stuff, as I say, carries over the evoke. That's it. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to finish my drink off. Throw in a little air con bomb so that the car smells nice. And hopefully, I'll keep my dad motor in for another 7, 8, 9,000 miles. As always folks, if you enjoyed the content, please subscribe, give a like, give a comment, etc. Um, I know there's always a lot of people that are going to argue about using the pressurized bulb method for all in using the uh, pre-filling of the fuel filter. Pre-filling the fuel filter works fine for me. First crank works straight away. No problems at all. Um, you only need the bulb if you let the system sit and empty out for absolute ages. If you have it pre-filled like I had, one out, one in. Bang, job done, and it will crank straight away. No issues, no problems, great motors. Uh, before I hand it back to my father, I'm going to check over everything else. So, that's it, folks. If you want to sponsor the channel, memberships are available. If you want to hit the eBay store up and get merch, key rings, air fresh, you know, the usual goodies, um, please do. Um, but yeah, that's it. Catch you guys all in the next video, and hopefully that will encourage some of you freelander owners to save some money, because at the bare minimum, you saved yourself two hours of labor from a mechanic somewhere. See you there, folks.